Uh, you need to define what the projects you are going to be on and write a little uh, motivation. Write, write the first part of it would be maybe maximum a couple of pages. Maximum a couple of pages uh, creating the tension. The tension meaning is the motivation why this is a good project. Okay, is uh, in the in the tension part. You don't do a literature review. You may mention some literature. Okay, but uh, the most important in the tension part of a paper is to strongly motivate why that's important. Okay, I have something that I usually have a little bit of problems with tensions of papers. Is very often people use us. Um, kind of current references. The PCOB is very interested on it. Uh, ACL has a program on this or something. And my, my trouble with that, uh, typically, is that, uh, you know, you are writing an academic paper. You don't want to put too much in there that is kind of very current news that in two years when people read your papers will not be that current anymore and not be that interesting. And on the other hand, you might need it for motivating the paper. So that's kind of, a, I think, is a confusion that everyone has in this particular type of, of problem. Okay. So when you're writing the tension, you try to write why is this an important problem. Okay. And every paper needs that. And you get very easily rejected if you haven't done that. Okay, so next week, let's talk first about next week. Uh, next week, I'm going to ask you to read five articles. Not exactly. Not exactly. Um, I'm going to ask you to read uh, the paper that Alex, me, and Denise are writing and is. Um, and uh, has, is going to be greatly cut. It's a 91-page paper, and uh, it's not going to be the final version. You've seen Denise talk about the paper in the first class we had, but the reason for that is I don't need you to do a deep reading of the paper. I want you to choose two articles that she mentions there and review it. So two articles on analytics, or find another one. Okay, so I want to write. So the first one is the article on contingent equations, is the Kogan et al. <coughs> Came out in the audit journal uh, in 2014. Okay, and then you choose two articles on analytics. Because I want kind of the, the class to talk about different analytics here. If, and then I want you to have a look at I will call the Denise paper uh, and uh, Cha Cha is going to send it to you. And finally, and finally I've sent you already a matrix. And this matrix is very interesting because it's a matrix looking at audit analytics uh, in the standards and assertions prepared by ASAC. It's something that you wouldn't have access other places, although there is no secret on it. And just have a look at that thing and understand how it works, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. We'll teach you a little bit about auditing. We'll teach you a little bit about assertions. It's a, it's a very interesting matrix, and I want to have next week a discussion of it. Discussion. Okay, and finally, I'm going to write so I'm going to call it the matrix. Here is two papers. Any one I'm going to write yourself a little summary or slides or whatever. I'm going to ask a couple of you to talk about it, about the paper. Do that enough to explain to the other people what the paper does. And the Denise paper, uh, I can tell you in advance what's going to happen in that paper. We talked to the editor of the audit journal. Okay, and he doesn't like the survey. Uh, it's not that he doesn't like the survey. The reason why he asked us to write this paper, asked me to write this paper, 
is because he wanted something else. And so we are basically putting the paper into two. We are taking the literature, the big literature review out and putting it into a separate paper that we most likely will submit it to the Journal of Accounting Literature, the one out of Florida, John. And then this paper is, is basically aimed at uh, understanding and having ideas of big data and analytic methods in audit research. So it's kind of become, one paper becomes two papers. By the way, the, this paper, the Kogan, yeah, which I think I mentioned to you before, took us 10 years and three months to publish. And uh, because I don't like this being tapered, I'm going to say it anyway. And my partner in the paper, Professor Kogan, is very stubborn. And he refused to cut the paper in two, which I wanted to do from the beginning. Um, and so it took 10 years to publish it. If he, my guess is that uh, if we had cut it in two, we would have in five, six years got it in. Okay? And we would have probably got the next one in in a year, something like that. And it's just sometimes complicated papers with too many pieces on it. Uh, editorial board has a lot of difficulties with. Um, and so, and particularly if it's very different from the, from the traditional, traditional literature. <coughs> this paper here, well, first paper in continuous auditing, 91, uh, got rejected twice by the audit journal. Okay, but I st stuck to my guns and argued with the, with the uh, editor, and when he ch left and someone else came in, they published it immediately. So what does this tell you about publications? Hmm? Yeah, and talk to them, and talk to them. Uh, can you put your name in front of you? I don't know your name yet. I know who you are, but I don't know your name. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of people don't realize they can discuss things with, or, with editors. And you can. And uh, sometimes they are stubborn. When we submitted uh, this paper to, to, the, uh, to the accounting review, they turned it down. And one of the referees said that we didn't know what was continuous audit. So tell you what quality of refereeing we got. Uh, unfortunately, at that time when I had submitted it, I had asked it to be submitted to a social editor that in the AIS area. And what they did, they sent it to a associate professor from Stanford at, um, uh, at the Managerial Accounting area. So he really didn't understand the article. And so when he, when the accounting review editor stepped down, I talked to him. And the new editor came in, and the new editor basically said, uh, we have an agreement that we're not going to reconsider papers. And now, if I had done what I wanted to do with the paper, which is cut it into two, I could have argued that when we got it in, that this is a substantially different paper you need to reconsider. But as I just really had improved the paper, I couldn't argue that, because it was basically the same paper, just improved. Uh, and so th these are the kind of things that you think about papers. Um, and you should always have uh, this in mind. You know, if you really think that your paper is very good and uh, it was imbecility from the art editors not to accept it, or some other reason like uh, they want to publish in one particular area and their paper is in another area, etc., then you need to kind of think what your route is uh, in publications. And never let the paper that you got back rejected sit on a shelf for six months. Bad idea. Go at it immediately, as soon as, while it's fresh, while you still remember what you did there, and et cetera. You might decide not to go back to that journal, or go to another journal. And there, when I was doing my early research, there were two or three journals accounting. Uh, the accounting review, JA, JE had just started, uh, et cetera. And JA, for example, had a reasonably wide agenda of what they published. Nick Dobbins was an eclectic editor. 
Um, now there are 30 journals, 40 journals. Just in the AIS, there are five. And I don't, and so it's, very, it's a very different world. And uh, some professors tell you only publish in A journals. That's not what I say. Uh, we have two cases here at Rutgers of people with they're very competent. They managed to get one article A journal in the six years they were here. They had to leave. So unless you are at Stanford and they, that's all what they tell you that you should do. But even at Stanford, I don't think they tell you that anymore. And so need to kind of understand the balance of your articles and where you are. And the other thing is schools give you a very aggressive point of view of what tenure is in that institution. I think I told you the story about Columbia. Let me just repeat when I was there. Um, they used to tell everyone that you need an A journal publication every year to get tenure in Columbia. And at that time, they hadn't tenured anyone for 25 years. Hmm. OK. Um, and uh, so at that time, Joe Burke and myself created the database we call the mm -hmm. Audit Literature Database, the one that uh, Vicky did her dissertation out about three years ago. And we calculated that. And it turns out that only Bill Beaver had ever done that, six A publications every, uh, a publications every year, and even Bill missed a year. Okay, and so when I showed that at Columbia, I wasn't very popular, but I think they kind of reconsidered a little bit what they, what they were saying. And they, they, I think here at Rutgers, we also say similar kind of things, which make no sense. Okay, and the other thing about the tenure clock pretty much everywhere, is it's very short. It's very short. It's uh, uh, very often people come up for tenure on the sixth year, and that means that they have to put their case together on the fifth year. Uh, journals take two, three, four years to publish, so that tells you immediately why I now tell our AIS PhD students that you better get published while you're here in the program because it's very, very short. And the other thing you need to do is not only get published, but fill up your pipeline. The pipeline is very important. And that's why I say, don't let the article sit for six months. Send it to the pipeline. If you get discouraged or get very tired of the subject, which is a very likely kind of thing, uh, go to the next thing and send it to a lesser journal. And it's no harm to send an email to the editor with the article and saying, I'm thinking of submitting this to your journal, can you give it a look? Is it appropriate for your journal? Is it the kind of thing that you are interested in? And I, would, I never did a study of that, but I bet you that changes your chances of acceptance a little bit up, or very off. I don't know if it's a little bit up or very up, but it changes your chance of acceptance. Now, the other thing is that if you are submitting to, to journals that don't get a lot of submissions, the editor will remember your article. If you're submitting it to accounting review, uh, they, they won't remember, meaning it's a total mechani mechanized process. Uh, I, I don't like these mechanized processes. When I was editing GIS, which is the journal I edited before, um, I tried to come out of the me mechanized process, just do it directly with the author, because when I had JTA before, that's what I used to do, and I got uh, really harassed by it by the AEA to the point that I had to go back and use that horrible system they have. <coughs> they have a very, very bad uh, electronic system. And uh, I don't like to raise a lot of fuss, so I kept my mouth shut. But when we go to those publication meetings and I talk with the other editors of AEA journals, they all have a lot of trouble. What I do now is uh, Tiffany helps me with the journal. And so Tiffany knows how to use that system reasonably well. And so she deals with it. And uh, I bet you that half of the people that submit or that I reviewed um, need Tiffany's help to get something done. It's that bad. I mean, a, a, a software system should never be there. So it, it kind of what happened is it took away, it made it maybe a little bit more repetitive, but it took away that kind of narrower, better contact that you had with the editor which I think is very important, creating that relationship, etc. Now, that said, 
edit editors of journals change every three years. So you create, create a relationship with one editor, by the time that you send another paper to him, maybe there is another editor there. Uh, but that, that whole thing said, one thing should be in your mind, publish. That's it. Okay? You have to be satisfactory in teaching, you have to be publisher more than anything. Satisfactory in teaching. Can't be a terrible teacher. Many schools will take that very adversely. And even if the school tells you this is only about research, if your teaching is really terrible, they it's not very good for tenure. And the other about half of the people don't get tenure in their first job if they go to a reasonable university. And that's not bad. That's actually quite good. Gives you opportunity to explore a little bit more what you want. Uh, but it's not, not a very good system. I don't think that the period should be six years. I think it should be 10 or 12. Uh, I think uh, committees that evaluate tenure should read the articles, not count articles. I think the ABC rating of journals is pretty much of a pathetic, mindless exercise. Uh, uh, but I know, for example, in China they are adopting a lot of our things here, correct? Of promotion, and it's very bad, very bad, because you you finish up uh, not evaluating. My my standard story, I think I also mentioned here before, is Catherine Shipper was a professor. <coughs> Uh, got a PhD from the University of Chicago at that time, best school around. And then she went to teach at Carnegie. And uh, after teaching at Carnegie, Chicago brought her back oh. as a full professor, uh, obviously with tenure and editor of JAPA. And she had two publications at that time. Two publications, you didn't get tenure at Rutgers. But they had read her articles and knew how smart she was. She pursued, continued being editor of JAR. No, I didn't always agree with her. She, <coughs> when she started being editor of JAR, she sent a letter out saying that she was not interested in judgment, uh, auditing type of articles, which Nick Dokovich published a lot. And so I stopped submitting to JAR. And I had like at that time four in JAR or something like that. Uh, so that wasn't very good. But she finished up uh, going to FASB, and she was a board member for two periods, or so 10 years, and now she's back at Duke, I think, at this moment. But she had a very good career, and she did a lot of good things for, for accounting. Uh, but you know that Chicago had the courage of tenure <coughs> with a uh, sparse record. And this is even more relevant to my accounting PhD students, like Schwann, than to the AIS PhD students, because the, the world there is a little bit different. Accounting, uh, there is a lot of people doing financial accounting research, and uh, I think the situation is less fluid, and you don't know everyone, and you don't know what people are doing, and etc., etc. The other thing that's happening in the financial accounting world which I think is uh, very deep, is the fact that uh, the financial accountants are creating a journal. So many of the articles are going to now not go to the accounting review, but go to this new journal. And I've seen what they are planning to do with the first two issues. I think the first one comes at the beginning of next year. Uh, and it's going to be, they have a good editorial board, they are doing some interesting things. But it's going to change very dramatically the scenario of what's a top journal in account. I think it's great for AS research because I think the accounting review will stop being so focused on financial accounting and wonder who is the next editor. The nominations for next editor already went out. So let's see what happens there. <laughs> I argued strenuously for a non-financial accounting chief editor. You see, uh, if you follow management science, management science has sections, and the de facto editor of articles is not the chief editor. 
uh, but is the AV editor. And typically the AV editor, if you are in a smaller area, like AIS, you will know them and you, they'll understand the kind of research you do better. So it'll be very interesting because neither JIS nor uh, JTA or IJIS or ISDA are a journals, although a couple of countries like Australia considers one a, a journal. Uh, however, if the accounting review starts accepting these articles, it won't be very good for JTA, but be very good for AIS researchers and for AIS in general. I'll just tell you another thing to kind of puzzle you a little bit. This is actually typically the conversation Michael Alex has in the last <laughs> in the last session of the AIS survey seminar. You were there last year, and he talks about the career and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but what he said last year is that if you publish what he called case research, like uh, our continuity equation paper, this one that you're going to read, or you publish. Uh, process mining like we did, etc., uh, is not good for your career. What he forgot to say is that in 2014, he got one in the accounting review and one in the audit journal. And I think it would have been very good to anyone's career to, to, the, to do that. So I don't think it's true that you, uh, that King's articles uh, or applied articles. Now, what has happened with Jim Hunton's situation, with Jim Hunton um, having all those papers recalled, right? um, and he did behavior research, there is more skepticism about the data you have. When, Jim, when the Jim Hunton thing happened, and I have discussed this too, uh, I thought about that carefully. Um, and uh, I, I said, well, if we work with Itaú, we work with KPMG, okay? And if there were doubts about my data, what would I do? I would call Itaú up or call KPMG up and say they have in doubt about my data. Can you tell them that that's my data? <laughs> you don't have to put the pub domain. And by the way, if you want to, can maybe you want to let them touch the data, but they'll sign a non-disclosure agreement. And that would have, I guarantee you would have been no problem. They would have done that. As far as there is an NDA and et cetera. So that when Jim didn't want to do that, I kind of figured out that there were some problems with his data. So I, I don't think this, uh, this fact that applied research uh, or research with company data uh, has problems is a valid line. Actually, real data from companies uh, gives you a lot of opportunities to research that you wouldn't have other ways. Okay, and uh, the CompuStat stuff is pretty dry. Uh, I'm going to say something that I might repent later, but uh, I think that uh, accounting data, like the the kind of disclosure data that forms CompuStat, is very weak data in the sense that you know, FIFO, LIFO, depreciation are kind of a bad measures of business. And because of that, you can't expect that uh, comparing those and doing adding variables, etc., you are going to do something that is really tremendously valuable for accounting. Because that's not the way companies account. Companies today account with ERPs. And instead of, and uh, just a very few number of reports out of the ERPs go into the financial statements. Companies today account with the other pieces of the ERPs. And you know, they don't manage just the financial numbers. You managed financial numbers and inventory in the Middle Ages when double entry was invented. Today, management resources, intellectual property, uh, supply chain, et cetera, et cetera, to run your business. And by the way, financial stuff is the tail of that, of that dog. And uh, that tail these days is very disjointed from the dog because of the nature of accounting measures. No, you're not going to protest about that? No. <laughs> you're not going to protest? None of the accounting students are going to argue with me about this? I would argue if I disagreed. 
oh, <laughs> you guys, you should argue with me. Professors, particularly Chinese students, professors don't know everything what they're talking about. So you have, you have to argue. And if there is no argument, it's no fun, and you don't, don't learn. Okay, and if you don't argue, I'm going to start arguing with you. So, <laughs> so, so, that. so what, I've done in, uh, what I've done in these three weeks, what I, I am doing these three weeks, is basically introducing you uh, to a view of auditing, which is not everyone's view. Uh, in the media uh, of the audit session that I was, uh, I, a lot of people are doing behavior research. There is a large, large part of behavior audit research going on at this particular moment. Uh, so my, my stuff is not generic. Now, schedule-wise, you notice that I had wrong dates in the schedule. And uh, Charles sent it out. And what happened is I'm going to be out of the country for two weeks, starting the following week. And so Helen is going to do the class she was going to do anyway uh, on behavior, uh, not next week, the following week. And then the other week I had the Friday occupied, but the I am not going to be back at that time. Uh, I'm not cutting any class, you have exactly the same number of classes, but the Friday is a different Friday. Just look in the calendar, make sure that you have the dates correct. If the date I change is not good for you, uh, we'll Skype the session for you and we are going to record the session for you so you can attend it. And my apologies, I don't usually do this. I actually will have this problem again next, uh, this semester, but unfortunately, is not my choice, okay? Okay, that said, let's kind of get started with our presentations. Um, I think we should do this in chronological reason of order of the paper. So this is the paper I want to discuss. It's the Vassarelli and Halper paper. Uh, and who are the two people reviewing it? Okay, so why don't you do a presentation on it and you comment on it, okay? And I assume everyone else read it. This paper, while, while uh, Yehuda is setting up, uh, this paper was a paper I told you was rejected once. And uh, this is the first paper on the whole literature. It's been quite well cited over the years. Um, and uh, I think a lot of the technology we have, <coughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I think a lot of technologies we imagine that time don't exist anymore, and new technologies we replaced. I'm going to talk to you about a little bit about when you finish the discussion.